Good morning. So today, uh, what are we talking about? Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Sassy here. Is anyone there? Hi, my name is Sassy. I'm based in Berlin and I want to welcome you to Sisi, the podcast where you see what others see. In this, our first season, we're talking about colors. I want to welcome my wonderful co-host Petra van Phelan, here sitting by my side, who will co-host this chapter of the series Colors with me. Good morning, Petra. How are you? Hi, Sissy. I'm good, and I'm very enthusiastic about our guest today. He was born in Buffalo, New York in 1977 and has published impressive books of photographs, including East of the Sun, West of the Moon, Harvard Works Because We Do, Zizix, which was winner in 2016 of the Photo Book of the Year by the Paris Photo Aperture Foundation Photo Book Awards. And among many prizes, he was a recipient of Guggenheim Fellowship in 2014 and is an associate member of Magnum Photos. He holds a BA from Harvard University and MFA from California College of the Arts. He has been teaching in a number of schools, including Harvard University, California College of the Arts, University of California, Berkeley, School of the Museum of Fine Arts, and currently he is professor at the Rochester Institute of Technology teaching photography. His work has been exposed in various galleries and museums in group and solo exhibitions in New York, Boston, San Francisco, Philadelphia, Berlin, Munich, London, Paris, Amsterdam, Belgium, Milan, and the list goes on and on. We are very pleased to welcome Gregory Halpern. Hello, Gregory. Welcome. Hello. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Gregory, let's get started. Okay. For those that do not know you yet, I want to ask you if you see yourself as an artist, a journalist, and or a storyteller. Could you describe yourself a little bit and tell us, in your opinion, how do your photographs reflect you as a person? Mm. That's a good question. And I feel like it's a question I should have an easy answer for, but I don't. Um, I think of myself as somewhere uh, closer to maybe a poet, which um, I worry maybe sounds pretentious. But when I think of storyteller, I think of someone who has a plot, you know, a beginning, middle and end. And, um, and maybe a journalist, I think of someone who has... Uh, information they're trying to share or change they might be trying to bring about. But when I think of making pictures, for me, it's more about really evoking feeling and, and creating something very open-ended that the viewer can, um, can bring themselves into, you know, create space for them to bring themselves into. And so for me, when I think of like a literary equivalent, it's, it's maybe closest to poetry is, is how I might answer that. Gregory, I recall when I saw the photos from Henri Cartier-Bresson in an exhibition at FOAM in Amsterdam in 2005, I was overwhelmed by the intense expressiveness of his photos, even if they were black and white. They're really emotionally striking pictures, and he never did any editing afterwards. After your book, Harvard Works Because We Do, which is in black and white, you fully switched to color photography. Uh, what would be the motivation to do a project or a specific photo in black and white for you? Can a black and white picture be more meaningful than a color picture? I think for me, there was a time when I thought black and white pictures were more truthful somehow when I was first studying photography. And then I remember I had a teacher uh, named Chris Killip. And Chris at one point said to me that black and white is actually a... Uh, an abstraction. It's actually a distortion of reality because we see in color. And that was a very simple point, but it, it stayed with me. And, and I realized that, um, that color somehow felt both more real, but also there is a surrealism that color could create, uh, when the, let's say the color shifts ever so slightly and, um, something seems slightly, uh, not no longer neutral or it becomes, um, there's a little bit of yellow in a, in a picture that creates, that sh shifts the feeling a little bit. So color for me was very exciting 
making that switch. And I never, I never went back because I felt like it, yeah, at once it was both more real and, and more uh, surreal. Color pictures also reflect actually a, a portrait of a certain epoch from black and white to soft color tones in the sixties to gradually more intense colors nowadays. And today the technical possibilities to edit the colors of a photo during the post-production seem endless. To me, the colors of your photo prints appear, appear very pure and natural, though. Do you do any color correction or changes or adjustments to your photos at all? And if so, why would you do that? I do adjust color, but it's um, I try to keep it fairly minimal. So I have a process. I always shoot film because for me, the colors of screens, monitors, and phones can be a bit... Um, abrasive. The colors can feel uh, electric, you know, or overly saturated or crass, you know. And so for me, there's like something about analog colors that I'm really in love with. And so what I do is I shoot film and then I scan the negative. So I, I'm working off of a digital file ultimately, but I'm always trying to make it look like it was printed in the color darkroom, which is how I learned color photography was printing in the analog color darkroom. And so I sort of fell in love with that color palette, which to me felt very, um, yeah, neutral and uh, uh, soft, a bit softer. And uh, so I'm always going for that. I'm, so it takes a lot of work actually sometimes in post-production to get to that because you take this digital scan and then you have to spend, you know, sometimes hours getting it to look more natural or neutral or analog, but that's always my, my goal. And it involves many, making many prints. So I, I make little, one little print and another little print and then I put it into a, a light, a light box that has like a daylight balanced uh, light bulbs. And so I always try to look under those, those conditions. And I'm, it takes sometimes weeks and months because I have to print the picture. And then I like to um, forget about the picture, put it away somewhere. And then on another day, bring it back out and look at it under these lights. And then I see it's very easy. I say, oh, it's green, <laughs> but I can't always see it in the moment. Or I need my wife, uh, Andrea Parlato, who's an amazing photographer. Also, I look, I need her eyes sometimes to look and she'll say, yeah, it's pink, you know, but I can't see it. So I need, it's a slow process for me sometimes to get there. Uh, but it's one I love very much. Gregory, let us go now to cities like Buffalo and Detroit. The photos you have taken in industrial Midwest America portrayed the masculinity within the subconscious of American culture. And that has uh, struck me a lot. I mean, that's, that's amazing what you you can, um, you have been doing. Um, this is perfectly depicted in your photo book, Omaha Sketchbook, 15 Years of Midwestern Masculinity. These photos contain a sort of darkness. And then when you look to another photo book of yours, Confederated Moons, is this feminine, light, soothing palette that somehow makes you float in an almost surrealistic atmosphere. How did you internally experience this change of color palettes and what part of yourself was confronted when you commuted from addressing this masculinity to portraying a more feminine and subtle understanding of the world? I love that question. Thank you. Um, for me, the Omaha project started in 2005, I think it was. And so my, uh, I think my aesthetic and color palette shifted because the Confederate Moons project I shot in 2017. So the, the older work, Omaha Sketchbook, even though it, I worked on it for 15 years, it started at a time when I was more interested in like a documentary uh, aesthetic that was a bit more harsh and uh, aggressive. So there's flash in the picture, which makes um, colors brighter, shadows darker, and it makes the shadows sharper. Everything is a bit more, yeah, aggressive. There's a, vi a violence in those pictures even that uh, I wanted. I wanted to explore because it was all about this, this, um, yeah, this heartland of American masculinity. But then in 2017, the project you mentioned, Confederate Moons, 
was about this, um, for me, it was about this very strange, it was all shot during one week in America where um, there was a full solar eclipse. And the same week there was um, violent racial protests happening. And so, the, you know, including uh, uh, tragically a uh, death of um, a white supremacist drove his car into a, uh, a crowd of protesters. And it was a very horrible week in American history, but at that, at the same week, a few days after this tragic event, everyone paused and looked up into the sky and saw this solar eclipse. And for me, the strange surrealism of this moment when there was um, very painful reality happening on the ground, but then this sort of magical surreality happening in the sky, that's what I wanted to, um, to think about was those two things happening simultaneously. And so the color palette, I think, became a bit, yeah, mo maybe more feminine. Um, uh, there's pinks because of the flowers and blues because of the sky. I love pink and blue together. Yeah, like this mother nature, right? Mm -hmm. And Gregory, you remind me from an, astro the, an astronaut, astronaut when he was watching the Earth from above. And there was all these conflicts going along the uh, the Cold War and so on. And he looked at this big blue atmosphere of, of, of ours, of the earth, and he was in a way describing what you're saying, like looking above, but in his, um, in, in, this, uh, in his place, he was looking down to the earth. And this was exactly the, the feeling that you were mentioning. Yeah, I, I feel like it's hard to put this into words sometimes without it seeming a bit, um, you know, cheesy or overly um, naive, but I do think that photographing nature and people and animals is something that there's, there's something that motivates me about um, a shared experience about being alive and being vulnerable as a, as a, as a being on earth. And that there is some way that maybe we can connect through, through these photographs. Um, For me, at least, that's, I think, part of what uh, keeps me going. Yeah, <laughs> I think you, with this, you answered already a little bit the next uh, question. Um, your photo books are really a read, stories without words. The experience of turning the page makes it a very intimate and personal experience. Could you share with us um, the joy you treasure in doing these photo books? For me... You know, I have I have two daughters, five and eight, and I was always amazed how when even when they were two years old, there was something really magical about how they would, you know, crawl over to my lap and they were so excited to sit in my lap and have me flip through a book. And it 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 reminded me of just like this magical power of of flipping through a book, that there's something very you know, despite devices being everywhere, there's something about this feeling of going on a journey of almost like, I think of it sometimes as like uh, drifting down a river and you don't know what's around the next bend. And I love that. And also it, it involves the viewer maybe more so than say a movie because the viewer has to turn the pages at the pace they want, or maybe they can go backwards if they want. And it really activates the viewer's mind in a way that I find is really special and beautiful. And, and also the viewer is often alone with viewing an art book. It's different than an exhibition. So I think for me, the art book, the photo book is like the perfect medium because of that. It's um, something I love experiencing and also for me, the most exciting thing to make. Yeah, and I think it goes back to that early experience of you know being a kid and going on a journey through uh, children's books, uh, but maybe even back to sacred books that we all hold um, in our minds as being uh, important to us. There's something about the book that's just uh, magical. Gregory, in part of your work, there is a provoking will to discomfort the viewer by displaying scenes that people rather not want to see. You become a spokesman, like a ghost that reminds us of these things. But more than exerting activism, your images are capable to trans forms something ugly into something beautiful, as if they possessed a redeemer force. In this sense, your photographs not only document reality, as we have been saying, 
But furthermore, they are transformed into pieces of art, as Petra was saying with your books too. And so uh, in this creative process, you bring texture, color, and other elements into play when you put everything in your photo books. Do you think you're in a moment in your career where you're about to jump to other ways of expression? That's really funny you should ask that because I have just started doing that. Um, and I surprised myself even because I'm making a film with a, um, a friend of mine who, who proposed to me making, he said, would you be interested in trying to make a film version of your work? And um, I said, yes, that sounds amazing. Um, his name is Jopa Rog, a Dutch filmmaker, actually. And he's been coming with me to Buffalo. We've just started working, but I have to say it's been like, it's been a really magical thing to basically go with him to photograph the same people in the same places. And then to see the footage where there's, you know, um, let's say we'll make the same portrait of a person But in his, there'll be wind in the hair or the light is shifting because it's a, a tree is blowing and the light is changing. And it's, um, it just adds this level of magic that is so compelling. And then, of course, when you introduce sound, which just sort of washes over you, I, I always feel like sound enters your body and it, it like a, is a direct link to the emotions. Uh, and so working with him on this film has been um, pretty exciting. I don't know if I'm... I, I, I don't I think I'll always take still photographs, but I feel like I'm at this moment now where maybe I'm I am moving into something else. Um and I'm also making these sculptures that are sort of photographic sculptures, but it's uh I think the film is what I'm most most excited about right now. In addition, would you say your your interest and in education in history and literature close the circle to create a synergetic piece of art? Oh yeah. For me, Yeah, like short stories. And um, I love this idea of reading where um, I think about the structure of a piece, like the opening paragraph and the closing paragraph really fascinates me. I like short stories for that reason, because I'm a slow reader, but it allows me to um, experience a lot of pieces quickly where I can see how was the story pieced together um, or Um, what's the narrative voice? Like I, I'm fascinated by this idea that the, the author doesn't have to be, you know, the same as the narrator. And so uh, I think about that a lot too. Like what's the voice I want to use when I tell a story if, with photographs? Who's the narrator? Uh, what's their mindset? Um, so for me, yeah, literature is a, is a great inspiration. It gives me uh, so many ideas of how to be, to try to be a storyteller. Gregory, we were talking about this duality always present in your work, opposites being presented at the same time, despair and hope, beauty and ugliness, all in the same image sometimes. <laughs> Greg, um, can you tell us, Gregory, or I want to say, when I see your work, I see that you transit from documenting your uh, to producing poetry, I would say, And without exaggerating, I would also say that this poetry takes the receptor to an almost theological experience, meaning that this cross point between opposites, this duality, carries a divine aspect. Have you ever encountered divinity while photographing? And in this sense, have you been able to consciously capture the essence of the purest of all colors? This being light? This is a beautiful question. Thank you. Uh, no one's ever asked me that. Um, and I I love that you you did because I've been thinking about what, I've been trying to figure out why I've always been so attracted to this idea of duality, despair, hope, good, evil, um, harsh, you know, harshness and sensitivity. And I uh, I don't have a good answer for it, but... I just find there's something really beautiful and there's like a tension that can happen. You know, let's say if a series of pictures feels too predictable, I start to get bored or I start to feel like uh, I'm being told the same story over and over again. And I feel a little bit like it's condescending, like it's not allowing me as a viewer to get confused and make up my own mind. 
And I, uh, I want to give my viewers that, that experience and also unsettle them a bit because I think when you're unsettled, um, or uncomfortable that you become a bit more awake, you know, it activates your mind and it makes you, um, you, you really have to figure out where, what am I looking at and how am I supposed to feel? And I like that. I don't want the viewer to be passive. You know, I want them to be uh, wide awake. And if they're uncomfortable, I think that's okay. You know, some of the things I'm looking at are uncomfortable, you know, masculine violence or poverty in Los Angeles. And, you know, those aren't comfortable things. So why should the picture be beautiful and soothing and reassuring? It, it shouldn't be, you know, so, um, yeah. And then I think your question about light is amazing because one of the other reasons I use film, this is a bit technical, but I love to photograph towards the light. You know, as a photographer, you're often told, put the light behind you. Um, but I like to photograph towards the light. And film, it's its one of the one things that technically film is much better at than uh, digital. Because digital is technically superior in a lot of ways, but film is more superior in its ability to capture both extreme light and extreme darkness all in the same uh, frame. It's called the dynamic range. It has a very wide dynamic range. And so you can photograph towards the sun and there might be a person in the foreground who's in shadow and it will all, that information will all still be there. And the, the, the transition from light to dark is much more beautiful in film. And so I love, I love to, to do that, but also there's something about looking into the light, uh, and just seeing the way light bounces off of something, even if the object or the person is, um, there's an aspect of despair in the, in the content of the picture. The light could give it a certain quality that speaks to um, something much bigger than, um, than the circumstances. Uh, and maybe that's the divine. Um, so, yes, I think uh, I've never maybe put it so put it in those words, but I'm, I'm glad you feel that in the pictures because I do think that's part of my uh, inspiration, part of what excites me. Well, you are able to transmit that, Gregory, yes, <laughs> for your me. information. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, so, I'm glad, very glad. Uh, Gregory, in an interview I saw, you once said, I've always made books with no text and titles that make no sense. <laughs> I found it really funny since I found your titles so poetic. And I would say it takes some effort to come up with these. How do you come up with these creative titles? <laughs> it's uh i laugh because i have a friend uh jason Fulford who i did uh my second book with which was just called a the letter a and i laugh because it, I, i could not pick a title and i had pages and pages and pages of titles and he was really getting frustrated with me and finally i there was a, a tattoo on a guy's chest that just had the letter a and i thought it was a very mysterious tattoo and i realized it was the perfect the perfect title but it was also the beginning of the alphabet and um it had other reasons but for me it's it's like pulling teeth it's so hard right now i'm working on a new book of pictures that's from buffalo and i just have pages and pages of titles again uh, sometimes i look at um, poetry or listen to the lyrics and songs or uh, i've i've i'm not a religious person but i've looked in the bible for example before um I just look everywhere and I love, and, and then sometimes I'll take words, I take titles and I'll mix them together. So one word from one title and one word from another title. And, and then eventually, uh, I, it feels like luck. It just has to be luck that two things, two or three words wind up next to each other, or I open the right book at the right time and, and it feels right. Uh, but I wish I had a better system because it's, it can be quite, uh, uh, frustrating and also nerve wracking because I feel the deadline approaching and I don't have a title yet. And it, 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 to me, that's so important to find the right title. So, um, very tricky. <laughs> and besides the influence of natural light and the colors present in each of the different landscapes between, let's say, Midwest America versus California or Guadeloupe, was there any other major external influence like another person or other artists' work or private experience that inspired your work or the topics you wanted to address? Do you have a photographer who inspires you? Is a great example for you? I, there are many, so many photographers who for me are, I've, I've looked at them and, and almost like absorbed them into my, my work. Um, 
some of my teachers, mainly uh, Jim Goldberg, Larry Sultan, uh, Chris Killip, to name a few. But um, there's one painter named Charles Birchfield, uh, and his paintings, he lived in Buffalo for much of his life, where I grew up and where I'm photographing now. And his paintings have this almost psychedelic quality where, where there's like, um, yeah, there's something surreal happening or otherworldly happening. And I, I look at his paintings and I often wish I could be a painter. I, I, I just feel I wish I could do that. And I've tried. It's, I'm not very good at painting. But um, I find the spirit of his work lately to be very uh, inspiring and... Um, it's like the feeling that I want in my pictures, even though it's it's hard to do the same thing with photographs. Um, yeah, so he's maybe the one I'm thinking about most lately. Gregory, in your photo book, again, Omaha sketchbook, as you were editing and choosing different color backgrounds for its composition and assembly, was the choice of colors a purely aesthetic decision? Hmm was really intuitive a lot of the time. So I had this studio I rented in Los Angeles when I was making it. And I would just, I had all these tables and I would just cover the tables with the, the little pictures, the contact sheets. And then another table would be just the colored paper. And I would just mix and match and mix and match, you know, like all day long and play. And, you know, sometimes it would be my first instinct would be, let's say it's to put a picture of a, you know, let's say hunting on red, you know, and maybe that's the obvious choice. Uh, and sometimes that worked perfectly because it, it, it was perfect and simple. I, I didn't want it to be too complicated. It was like a sketchbook. So, so sometimes that first instinct I would keep. And then sometimes I would look at it and think, oh, that's so stupid. You know, it's, I'll try it on blue or I would try. And so, um, I would try it on many, many different colors and, uh, I didn't have a scientific method or anything. It was really just, it had to have impact emotionally Im immediately, but then it also had to, I had to still like it a day or two later. So those were sort of like, so sometimes what I would do is I would photograph it if I liked it and then, and then change it. But I, but once I photographed it with a high resolution camera, I knew I could go back to it later. So I would just play all day long and document as I went and, and sometimes pick the final choice later. Sometimes there were ideas like, let's say a soldier, you know, on brown would feel very different than a soldier on pink. Again, that's a really simple example, but I, I liked the way sometimes a, an unexpected color could work with a picture because it changed the way you, 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 you read the picture. So that was fun also to play with those feelings. And then towards the end of the book, the pictures, the colors got darker blacker it, it it faded towards the night a little bit it became a bit more tragic like the end and the book the end yes <laughs> <laughs> the end <laughs> and, and and the book opened with yellow and sunrise so there's a little bit of an arc of a day of a day, uh, the course of a day happening but not exactly okay i think we have come to our last question uh gregory how how would you find um inspiration for a new project or a new book do you purposely look for inspiration for a next topic, culture, or place to depict? Or is it an intuitive decision, maybe based on curiosity or coincidence? It's almost always been, I'll have an idea in the back of my mind, and um, and it, and it very slowly um, becomes a project. So it's, it's almost never like I'm searching around for an idea and I pick something to do. The one time... I really did that was um, with that project Confederate Moons when there was this eclipse and this tragedy in America at the same week. And I thought, here's an idea. But um, even that kind of came to me intuitively. So um, I try not to think about it too much. I try to wait until I feel excited to just go shoot. Um, because for me, uh, I, I think a lot, but I also think... I, I, for me, art is really about feeling first. So um, I have to, I have to just want to go photograph it, and then with the pictures, I have to just want to look. Uh, so thinking and analyzing for me is always like a secondary thing. Is I, so I try to shut that off and almost think like a child. Like, what is a child attracted to? 
you know, what do I want to look at? What, what light is, is pretty, <laughs> you know, I, I just try to embrace that and then not, um, not, um, like, uh, judge my ideas too harshly in the moment. I just try to go, go with that intuition. Gregory, thank you for this terrific interview. But before we finish, we want to make you the very, very last question. Okay. So there is a pilot project that has been applied in intensive care units in hospitals in Germany. They put electronic ceilings with changing colors on the top of the beds of the recovering patients. According to a study, this has helped patients in their well-being and their recovery process. I want you to close your eyes and imagine yourself as one of those patients looking to these changing colorful ceilings. Why do you think colors might have this healing power? Mm. Closing my eyes and just thinking about this for a moment. You take your time. Colors seem somehow pure. You know, maybe even uh, there's a holiness to, to color that maybe can, can create hope or um, a reason to, to go forward. That's beautiful, Gregory. Thank you so much for your time and an amazing interview. Thank you so much for, for having me and for your thoughtful questions. I really appreciate being here with you. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you, Sissy. Please be sure to check this chapter's description to find out more about Gregory Halpern's photography and upcoming projects. Thank you, Petra. And thank you to our listeners, wherever you are, for having allowed us to share time with you. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.